Today we're talking to uh, Lisa Mitchell and Virginia Woods-Jack um, and we're having a conversation about uh, well women in photography in New Zealand basically. Lisa and this is why you should probably always update your LinkedIn and uh, websites is the curator of historical documentary photography at Te Papa um, with an interest in uh, vernacular, colonial, memorial, regional and the bits I liked random and wonder. Um, she received a grant from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, which has allowed her to do some research on women photographers in New Zealand up to 1960, which at some point in the future will be a book. Virginia is a British born photographic artist, advocate and curator, currently living and working in Wellington, as we all are. Um, her practice explores notions of connections to place, materiality and memory to consider relationships between the human and more than human worlds. Um, today we're talking in, to her in her capacity as the person behind Women in Photography NZ in Australia, highlighting female and non-binary creators working in photo-based arts, where she aims to engage, connect, collaborate and debate. Just going to mute someone else. There you go. Um, it seemed like a good combination of speakers, someone who's been looking at the representation of women in photography historically and someone who's very much involved with doing it now. So when I heard Lisa on Radio New Zealand, where she was talking to um, Lynn Freeman, um, and I was aware of Virginia, it just looked like a really good combination. Um, and we've got a few images from both people that we can pull up to help um, push along the conversation. And I'll start with Lisa and then talk to Virginia and then open it up a bit. So please, um, we are not all in Wellington, someone said. Oh, I meant, I meant... <laughs> I meant Lisa, Virginia and myself are all in Wellington. That's what I meant. I'm sure everyone's from all around the world watching this morning. Um, and I'm also kind of acutely aware that um, I'm a man. <laughs> and, and that therefore, maybe I'm not best placed to, um, to moderate or facilitate this conversation. So I did mention that when I met up with Lisa and Virginia and they said it was OK. So there you go. It's OK. Um, so Lisa. I always like a bit of the background. Can you tell me something of your photography art background and how you came up and uh, came to be the creator of historical documentary photography at Te Papa and um, you ended up getting this research grant? Good morning, everyone. Kia ora katoa. Um, thanks for inviting me on and thank you for joining us from all over the place and, and, and Marie in Central Otago. <laughs> <laughs> um, my background, um, I, I spent a lot of my 20s trying to be an artist and a filmmaker and um, working in, I guess, in a Len Lai style with 16 millimeter film, um, making direct films that I called art films. And um, at some point I moved into um, being an adult student and studying art history. Um, and that introduced me to photography, in particular colonial New Zealand photography. Um, under the lovely and dearly Miss Roger Blackley up at Victoria University. After I graduated, I started working with people like Mark Strange in the Conservation Lab at National Library, and for a while thought I wanted to be a photo conservator, but couldn't afford to be. <laughs> um, basically, I travel overseas and study overseas at that point. Um, and so I've had a lot of roles since then in relation to um, documentation at the New Zealand Film Archive, or Ngā Tonga, as it's now called, um, looking after what isn't film that they hold, which includes a large photography collection and unpublished manuscripts, that kind of thing. Um, about, whew, I should say, 15 years ago, I <laughs> made the move to Te Papa as a collection manager of photography. Um, and six years ago, into um, a new role there in terms of um, historical photography, which was yeah, a new sort of focus on that as well. So, um, and then moving towards um, you getting this research grant, what was the what yeah. were the motivations? What was behind that? Um, I feel like it's been a long time coming. I'm noticing over the, the years working with all these different collections, um, if you like, the lack of photography made by women in these collections and I, I didn't think much about it but about five years ago I thought actually is this true let's find out so I'm um, on a sort of part-time basis I've been researching um, 
yeah, trying to broaden out that terrain, um, see who was there. I felt like there was a handful of people that were in some of the books um, by John Turner and Hardwick Knight, people like that. Um, and I thought, was there more? So I went on a bit of an exploration um, to see if there was more, um, disappointingly. Um, not a lot of them are held in public collections. And where they're held, um, they tend to be, um, I guess, not a outlying places, um, not the National Museum necessarily, though that's been part of this project over the last five years, sort of targeting, acquiring stuff as I go and as it comes up. Um, so to build the holdings at the National Museum. So do you, do you even know um, the details of like percentages? Is it like a tiny percentage of the oh, photography gosh, collection? Don't, don't get me slapped on me. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> not the best. But um, yeah, I think at this point, in a lot of ways, because it, it hasn't been collected, at this point you're coming along really late for looking for 19th century stuff. Um, also, one of the things I find studying this is, sorry, just getting a bit of feedback, um, is uh, it's, a, it's almost like a legacy thing. So um, if people are unmarried, um, there's stuff, you know, there's not necessarily anyone um, looking after their work after they go, um, so it sort of disappears, doesn't get collected, that kind of thing. Um, the studio collections around the country that are collected tend to be the big the big outfits in town or something like that. But then you have someone like, say, Mrs. Herman, Louisa Herman, who was in Wellington, that was a huge studio. But I think the timing of its sale in early 1900s, perhaps that's why it didn't, you know, it was just too soon it came up, you know, apparently 35,000 last plate negative so New Zealand people <laughs> yeah and is the what was the actual um is there an actual title as such to the research um application you know that, that you came up with or is it generally women in New Zealand pre prior to 1960 um I like calling it in the dark that's my working title at the moment um with you know the counter um woman and New Zealand photography up to 1960. So broadening it out from not just who's taking photographs, but looking at a broader, a, a broader kind of what's happening, what was happening, what were the roles, how did studios operate, who was doing what, what if women were there, what were they doing, that kind of thing. Um, so not just focusing on who's taking. Um, I think that's more of a 20th century focus. Um, you know, instead of a kind of making focus, uh, we're especially with when you look at commercial photography in the 19th century, the, the focus is on the product and it's highly finished um, object, right? It's a print on a mounted card. You know, there's a lot of labor in that and it's not just about, you know, the exposure of the negative as such. Yeah. Yeah, that's really um, interesting, isn't it? It's almost, almost like it, it's the patriarchal idea of the artist, of a man, and therefore everything is about who has create, done the final creation and it's not about the various issues that arise and need to be resolved during the creation of that image. It's really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of focus on great, the great. Yeah. Um, yeah, the master photographer, yeah. Um, so yeah, broadening from there. Um, what I've also been doing, um, I mean, it's been, I've been joking at times, it's a bit like being doing um, hundreds of people's family history research, right? Um, so. Often with when I when I work, I have a you know or other curators work. They have a starting point, right? Um, you have basic life details. You have the fact that someone is known to have done this. So what I've been doing is finding people who are not known to have done this, and then finding out their basic facts. <laughs> so that I mean that's been the huge part of it as well as tracking down their stuff. Um, and can you show me Miss Williamson? Yeah, sure. from here. Uh, this is a good example of where it started. Um, so Caroline McCorrie, I can see she's on here, um, went down to the West Coast. Can you see that all right? That first that's, one. Um, oh, that's the first one. That's um, so which there. one did you want? Sorry, this one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she found this in the um, Black Ball Museum. Um, it's a pretty standard late 19th century cabinet card um, with the photographer's information printed on the mounts, um, Miss A. Williamson. And um, so that was my starting point. And someone, um, Victoria Leachman at Papa, does a lot of work on Wikipedia. Um, 
part of a, a team kind of assembling, you know, information about women and loading them up, you know, botanists or scientists, all sorts of people. Um, and she found some bio info that um, she thought was interesting and the, the, just was able to marry these two things up, right? This lost person, um, Reefton, wasn't a big place for charting studios through newspaper advertisements or anything like that. You know, it would have been a word of mouth type situation. But um, yeah, so that, that's one way I found, that's how I found Miss Williamson. So thank you to Caroline for kicking that one off. <laughs> it's quite an interesting story. You can put it down now because I think I prefer. <laughs> okay. um, and do you want to talk about, as we've got the pictures up, do you want to talk about some of the others that you sent over? Um, Oh, okay. Uh, this is one that wasn't Mother's Collection um, by Marie Dean. Um, it's, quite, it's a beautiful child portrait. Uh, it came in um, as part of Bill Main's collection. That was a big part of the holdings at Papa. Um, she was in Wellington and Cuba Street, um, sort of more late, later um, than I'm at at the moment, but um, 1920s, 1930s. Yeah. The current focus I'm working through has been um, known people of the 19th century up to 1910. Hmm. And are you going to say uh, this well, one Mrs. as well? Cobb. So this is Mrs. Cobb. Um, I mean, it's not her, it's made by her. Um, she was a photographer in the Hawke's Bay with her husband, Joseph, who helped her out, but she was sort of the breadwinner, if you like. Um, she had... Um, been working as a photographer in England and came out here specifically to open studios. So they opened their stu first studio in Napier in 1884 and a second one in Hastings in 1885. Um, and that went probably to about 1900, I think. Um, sorry, I can't remember right off the top of my head right now. But I just read this one, the, the infant cloaked in this enormous blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and the hair roll on her head, you know, the plaited. I, I just think it's such a, they're just staring at us so yeah. gently. And it's, I just it's like, I love this portrait. It's, a, I know when we were talking earlier, Lisa, you said that there was generally a history of there being <clears throat> the, the husband's name. Mm. as the you know a very integral part of the the studio so how, how have you managed to work out you know who was the photographer and who was the sort of the the, the name of the studio if that makes sense okay well um most most women in the 19th century's lives were sort of controlled if you like defined by their relationship to their to men whether their fathers or their husbands or brother-in-law in the case of Miss Williamson who was up previously um so uh, you couldn't be a legal entity so even if you were running the studio it was in your husband's name unless you were you're a widow or um some other kind of circumstances um so uh Joseph the studio started um in Joseph and Harriet's name but um Joseph had some other business that he was involved in and he was made bankrupt a couple of years in and Harriet was able to argue that she could carry on so it became Mrs. Cobb so the studio just became Mrs. Cobb but uh, so that's a really clear example others it's it's a matter of you, you just can't know or mm. um, it's a matter of charting through um, you know uh, this this project would not have been possible before papers passed and uh, the digitization of a lot of records um, newspapers. Um, I spend a lot of time at Archives New Zealand. Um, I read a lot of people's wills and probates and all, you know, <laughs> court case files, police records. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, because um, yeah, I mean, no, there's not really many that let, if they did diaries, there's not, they're not kept, they haven't been kept. Mm. Um, but where they where they are, are some of the amateur people, which I, I will be writing up in a wee while. Um, some of them have, you know, that they are the diarists, if you like, that have been kept. Mm. So I'm also thinking, um, you, you were saying about how, again, when we were talking previously about how 
the studio images were very much about um, status symbols for the people being photographed. You know, it was a it was a sign of status to go and have your you know capture your image, your family image. I was wondering, um, I was wondering what the status of the photographer was like then. What the, you know, was it a well-paid job? Was it, you know, what? How did it work? Hmm. Um, I think I think it's it's a case by case. I mean, it was it was fairly notoriously hard going. I think in the nineteenth century, whether just to be a photographer here, um, whether that was uh, some things don't change. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. But, um, <laughs> whether that was personal, was, you know. Yeah personal circumstances but I mean I think the incidences of <laughs> okay the instances of um, bad luck a lot of people had um, perhaps you know they kind of all had <laughs> troubles that you know I think probably being trying to be a photographer here made it hard um, so Yeah, there's one there's one more picture that you sent over as well that um, that one as well because because the other question was um, I know your focus has been at the moment on studio mm -hmm. photography but over the time of the research you're expanding out aren't you to as you just said amateur photographers and landscape and art photography and I was wondering I don't know where you are with your research in that regards at the moment but. What's, what's the scope of what you're actually covering and what have you found in the, in the other areas so far? Okay, well, I, I, I like to feel like I'm writing a, a, a chapter of New Zealand art history that, um, sorry, photo history that um, is a bit of an untold one. It's, it's a forgotten one, if you like. And um, so I'm trying to be as inclusive as possible. And then as I write, I guess it gets narrowed down, obviously. But um, so yeah, the focus at the moment is on commercial but um, I'm, I'm looking also looking at um, family amateurs and leisure and and of course the creative I think of them as chapters yeah <laughs> um, but yeah they're big bodies of research um, where they'll end up sitting I'm I'm not sure yet so um, this is um, a photograph by Jessie Buckland taken from her home in their Karoa um, it's a good, she's a good example. I mean, I, I think um, I was reading recently a really interesting take on, um, you know, that photography wasn't necessarily, um, it was more, the, more of a class issue that kept people out initially. And the distinction between amateur and professional, I mean, the first photographers were amateurs. But, um, you know, so the, these things are really murky and it's hard to say, you know, obviously some people were commercial and that's where it ended, but other people did it all. You know, they were in camera clubs, they ran studios, they, um, you know, exhibited work as well. Um, so, you know, and Jessie Buckland's a good example of that. And, and the fact that she's also, she should be one of our most well-known photographers, yet to a lot of people, you say her name and they go, huh? <laughs> um, and she, yeah, so... Do you, have you noticed in your research, um, Lisa, if with the with women getting more rights, you know, like with suffrage and et cetera, whether there was any more proliferation or you know, production of, of women or, or does it not does it not sit alongside sort of historical changes for women? Or have you have you noticed that at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, any of those acts make big changes. So the Marriage Act, the Married Woman's Property Act, all those of the 19th century, they all change how people operate. And that's that's one of the things I've been charting mm. through, through this commercial chapter. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the, the, some of them are signing the suffrage petition. You know, um, Louisa Herman, the year she signs this, the suffrage petition well the year before her husband had died and left her with the business with the baby and you know I mean you can see that <laughs> probably understood the reason for it um but definitely um around 1900 the 1890s there's a big upsurge in this particularly young woman who start the business but I think that also comes from a lot there's a lot of writing at the time um encouraging the idea that um photography is a good profession for women because um 
I don't know, perhaps men have got a bit of a reputation for um, how they communicated with women in studios. I don't know, but you know, there's a, um, also just the upskilling of people who have been working in there for years and years, um, you know, wanting to step up, let alone if, you know, it's not just widows anymore, people having to make a decision at, at a time of crisis or mm. something like that. It's it, people actually choosing yeah, and I suppose the democratisation of photography as well as it became more and more accessible. You know, as in, as in when Kodak brought out the box brownies and, you know, when, when it became um, more of the sort of vernacular as opposed to it being something that really it was a case of whether you could even afford the, the equipment and the materials and everything. Oh, definitely you know. affording it no matter what. Was, was an issue, but um, with, with Kodak, it was proved a huge threat to commercial photography. Um, you know, the, if everyone could do it, who needed a commercial photographer anymore? So commercial photographers had to find other ways of proving their worth, um, you know, and I think as that, as time went on, by the 20s, you see particularly an upsurge where people are going, oh, okay, I do want a good portrait. I don't want to kind of you know, where, where people are too far back or the sun's in their eyes or whatever, you know, a typical amateur snapshot, if you like. So, yeah, the, um, the role of the commercial photographer became important again in people's mm. life, especially for important moments. Do you mind if I ask another question, Andy? Of course not. Go for it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious as to whether you've noticed any visual differences. I mean, because in... Can you can you tell that it's a, a female photographer? Uh, that was one of my questions as well. And I, I think I think coming as a photographer, we kind of almost we kind of want it to be something different that we can see and say women photograph something differently. But I heard you answer that before, Lisa. So I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think particularly differently. Um, I think women and men photograph everything <laughs> and in all sorts of ways and all sorts of styles. Um, that's my take on it. Um, particularly with um, commercial in the 19th century, um, it was about what the customer wanted more than mm. anything. Um, you see it coming through Miss Williamson, whose pick was up before um, from Reefton. Um, that, that and one other at Turnbull are the only examples of it where I've found. Um, and they both have, they're very faded, uh, sadly, but they both have really elaborate painted backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And in them, you know, little bit like things from the beach, driftwood and things like that. Uh, she was also an artist. She decorated, advertised to decorate paint murals in people's houses around Reefton and the West Coast. So I'm guessing that she made those backdrops, right? So, mm -hmm. and I've seen that um, with other people as well, but, um, also, I think part of the success of being a commercial photographer in the 19th century was knowing your market. So yeah. if, you, if you felt your community wanted their, their studio to look like a middle-class home, you set it up like that. Mm. Uh, this is Craig, Florence Craig, whose pick was up before. It's a good example. Lots of plants, columns, you know, things like that. If you felt they were more, more simple working class people, <laughs> maybe they just wanted a really plain studio. You know, mm. you know, um, yeah. It's yeah, interesting with your moving into more of the sort of landscapes and amateur, whether you do start to to see some differences, because I think, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you around around commercial work, you know, that you're working to the to the, you know, you're banging. I'm really bad with sayings. I don't even know why I try to use them. But um, yeah, it's your your master or yeah, your market is leads things doesn't it? Yeah, whereas with amateur and if you're creating images for a different different reason, then you can push a lot more of yourself, I suppose, into the work. So it'd be really interesting to see if you note whether you do notice any any differences, you know, with a more sort of female gaze, I suppose. Mm. Well, I, I, you know, what do you define as the female gaze, I suppose? I mean, you're saying women have more empathy or, you know, is that necessarily the case? I mean, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I think. Oh, the female gaze. Then, then I should I should direct you to a project that I've worked on with um, with Caroline and Christine, which is actually on photo form, which is all about the female gaze within photography within New Zealand. So, 
but it's within fine art photography and it's looking through the, the through the lens of a of, of a sort of seminal um speech by a woman whose name i'm forgetting maybe caroline can remember um about that the female gaze isn't the opposite of the the male gaze you know it's quite it's quite specific it's an interesting interesting essay looking at different photographers working um working in different ways um in new zealand so you might find that quite and i'd love to know what you what you thought in response to that um because i i think there is a difference i definitely think that there's a there's a difference i'm, I'm conscious yeah. that i should come out come to you now virginia because because lisa's been saying lots and i <laughs> i don't <laughs> think he needs a break um so virginia can you give me a bit of your you know background into photography and art and eventually uh, moving into setting up women in photography New Zealand Australia and then particularly we're looking um, at the looking to the future with progressive ideals which is the lightbox project you're working on in Wellington at the moment yes uh, I can see Caroline's putting there Jill Soloway's keynote lecture so that's that's a really good one for anyone to watch who's interested in you know, what the female gaze may be but she, yeah she talks about cinema but it's definitely transferable to photography um Potted history. Interestingly, I was taught how to use a how to take photographs by a man, um, by my grandfather, who was um, a huge influence in my in my life. Very gentle, gentle man. Um, and um, I then went on to art school in my early twenties. I always had a camera. I was like, I've I've always had a camera with me. It's just been part of my part of my life, really. Um, and then. So I went to art school in the UK, studied photography, came out of art school um, and decided I didn't want to assist anybody in that regard, but I was very interested in um, learning about the industry from the inside out. So I worked in a gallery for a couple of years, a photography gallery, learning about that side of things. And then I headed up, the. I started working for a fledgling agency called Growbag, which was set up by Greg Williams and his brother, Ollie Williams, in the UK. And um, Ollie's an artist, painter, um, Greg's a photographer. And um, yeah, I sort of then sort of started heading up the photographic wing of the agency, working with photographers like Simon Norfolk, Simon Roberts. Yeah, it was, wow. yeah, it was, it was incredible. Yeah, we were all really young, we were all in our, in our sort of your yeah, 20s and we had a lot of fun and I learned a lot and got to go to amazing festivals um, and then uh, ended up in New Zealand um, which was uh, which was a sort of product of my ex-husband's work um, he works in the film industry and also having a new baby I just had a baby so sort of landed on the shores of Aotearoa with a 12-week-old baby having never been here before uh, wondering what on earth I'd done um, and yeah I had a commercial wing to my practice for a while here in New Zealand and I agree with Andy it's it's a you know it's it's a hard job being a being a photographer in New Zealand and an even harder job for a female within the commercial world um, on that note women's work New Zealand which is a collective of Female commercial photographers has an exhibition opening today, actually, in Auckland. So good luck with with that. Um, and yeah, just kind of yeah, working over. I, I definitely felt like I was working more in isolation. Um, I had an amazing experience in the UK with very um, where basically everybody shared all of their information, all of their contacts, all of their experience, and I came here and everybody was. A lot more closed. Um, uh, I suppose just a smaller industry, smaller country, um, and yeah, I really missed that sort of connection to other artists. I did my masters um, at, at Massey, and that sort of opened some some doors for me. Um, but I still felt like there was this whole community of artists working away in the background who weren't didn't have representation with galleries and that their work, I, I wanted to see their work. I wanted to see different work. I didn't want to see the same work or this a work by the same photographers. 
over and over again. So I just sort of was looking at what was going on around the world. I was really inspired by Anna Fox's project um, out of my old university. Um, and I just sort of thought, you know, there's just so much great going on over here and in Australia. Um, and I just want to, um, yeah, I, I want to create a community. I didn't really feel like I'd found the community that I'd hoped for. So a bit like, you know, good old Kevin Costner's, you know, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to start women, women in photography. So, um, yeah. That was kind of the impetus behind it. Um, and I've had you know, help along the way from um, Caroline Macquarie and Christine McBetridge and, and many other people as well, Poppy Lechner, Sam Gorham, you know, just people being really supportive and really helpful and working on projects. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a great project. It takes a lot of energy, but it's a great, it's a great project and I'm very proud of it. And, and, and it's really good to see so many amazing artists who are working in New Zealand and Australia. And um, so what are the type of projects that you've been um, facilitating as part of women in photography? In general? Well, when, when I sort of started, I sort of realized that if I only put up work that I liked visually, then it would be a very, you know, limited project, really. So it was sort of really, one thing I say to all of the artists who share their work is if you need to be able to talk about your work. I want, I'm really curious. I want to know why you're making this work. What's you know, your, your research, what you're reading. You know, so people really share a lot about their practice. And so it's like an extended artist talk as opposed to an artist statement. You know, if all you want to put up is a, is a sort of abstract, um, comment then it, it doesn't it doesn't leave any space for the audience to come in so I throw out every takeover there's lots of talking leading up to every every takeover and backwards and forwards there's lots of planning from the artists of what they're going to write and how it's going to how it's going to play out and lots of feedback from me and then there's the sort of uh, curatorial conversation that goes on throughout the throughout the takeovers um, but off the off the back of COVID, um, I just sort of, people became so much more accessible. So I had a conversation with Tamara Dean, which was, which was amazing. She was, uh, she's an incredible artist working in Australia. And um, off the back of that, I was approached by a gallery in the UK to, ha to have a show with, um, they had, they had Tamara Dean and Brooke Home, both of whom are Australian photographers. And they were sort of like, we love what you're doing. And we wondered if you would be interested in uh, being in a show and co-curating a show with us. So that's with Informality Gallery in the UK. Um, and it's an English guy and an Australian woman. And um, yeah, it was just such an amazing project to work on. And it was all about uh, artists who are looking at relationship to, to land and the more than human world. So, I mean, it was completely in line with my practice. It was just like a dream project to work on, bar COVID, the fact that, you know, the gallery wasn't open for anywhere near as long enough. <laughs> um, but I got to work with artists, um, both from New Zealand and Australia, as well as there were artists from, from the UK, from Israel, from... Um, from France yeah it was just a, it was a brilliant brilliant project to to work on so that was that was incredible that from this little feed in New Zealand that I was able to be involved with a project like that and then up to current day I um I answered a call on the big idea for that the Thistle Hall were looking for a curator to work on the yeah light bring box. some bring some of those images out that'd be good yeah on the Lightbox project. And so that was the first outing of a um, New Zealand, you know, within a physical space um, in, in New Zealand. But I think what I was really drawn to was the fact that it was um, much like Instagram, you can only view a single image at a time and it's mediated through glass as you when you look at a phone um, and there's light, you know, just like a screen is, is backlit. Um, 
but I also really love the democratization of the space as well. It's totally accessible, just like a phone is, it's completely accessible. So anybody, you know, regardless of the, um, you know, physical abilities is able to go and view, view this work, um, but it's, it's iterative. So there's eight artists over a six month period and the curatorial statement um, comes from the actual writing on the side of the building, which I've always really loved. And it was um, a, a quote from a letter from the building management to a city engineer. And it says, it's saying, we look, we are looking to the future with progressive ideals. And I really like the, as we were saying in our conversation, the name of the, the exhibition in the UK was Lay of the Land, which taught things you think about surveying and, and politics and again, very male domains. And yeah, thinking about who would have written, you know, we look to the future with progressive ideals. That was probably from one Pakiha man to another Pakiha man. And again, sort of taking that and looking at it through a female lens of female and non-binary lens of, well, what does looking to the future with progressive ideals mean within the context of women in photography in New Zealand and Australia? And so then just going back through the feed and thinking about artists um, whose work I felt um, it uh, create images that look to a future that I really want to be a part of. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's not that, yeah, men don't have progressive ideals at all. I suppose it's just that I'm a woman and I feel like hugely comfortable in that, in that space and with those conversations. And yeah, you know, like I was sort of saying with Sarah Orms, you know, that sort of any future that we look to for me is, um, is intersectional. Um, and so it's coming from, from many, many angles um, and all of these artists when you look at them as a as a collection you look at them individually but you look at them as a collection have all got just really fascinating practices that um, I've been really I yeah I just think it's amazing that we're able to share their work and that hopefully that the light box is a jumping off point for um, for people to be able to learn more about both these artists but also about the the feed as a whole so yeah so that, i mean that's it's it's so great the way you do these stories on instagram which just gives a little bit more depth to the single image i remember speaking to a photographer in wellington about six months ago and he said i was he was really trying to keep off instagram because he felt like it's ruining yeah. his almost ruining his yeah. practice because he's just so used to this few seconds of seeing an image and then swiping to the next image and not actually engaging with photography in the way he wanted to but having this added kind of story thing just just pulls people in and makes them want to click through and get more information and then, yeah. having, and then having the spin-off of the of the light box and the exhibition you had in the UK is that is that kind of where I mean you're just obviously accepting any opportunities that come up that, that are fit are fit for you but is that where yeah. you go with it trying to try and make do more offline um, experience, oh, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely to do more real work. Cause I suppose I was wanting to put my head above the parapet and just go, hey, hey, you know, cause there's obviously like the Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere thing. And yeah, when I was moving here, everyone was kind of like, oh my goodness, why are you, go why are you going, why are you moving to New Zealand? There's no culture there. There's no this there. There's no, there's just lots of sheep. There's, you know, all of these, you know, it's beautiful, but you'll be bored and, and I suppose after having been here for nearly 18 years now and the feeds, so yeah, it was 50, I was here for 15 years before I even created yeah, Women in Photography. It was that thing of constantly wanting to you know, put my head above the parapet and go, there's amazing stuff happening down here. And I wanted it to have a global outreach, which was why I started it on, on Instagram. Um, and it's so much easier to say, hey, look at what we're doing as opposed to going just saying look at what I'm doing yeah I think it's very much about about community and similar to similarly to to Lisa who's working with these amazing archives that's what I'm I see women in photography New Zealand and Australia as it's a it's a place where people can now come and see what's 
I mean, it's a it's a microcosm of what's happening, and it's constantly going on, constantly being introduced to new artists all the time. Um, but it's building this this picture, which is why I love the artists to do, to use the stories. They're all highlighted and kept, and I do the insta lives, and they're all archived and kept because I want to create somewhere that people can come and see what is happening down here. And I've had. You know, some of the artists have been approached by galleries, others have been approached by writers. Um, you know, it's, this is, this is, you know, Instagram is really like the, the uh, place where everything is held and collected in a very modern form of an archive. But yeah, I totally want there to be offline opportunities for, for both the artists and the, the feed. Yeah, definitely. Um. I want to kind of open it up a bit to both of you and it's it's a sort of depressing question but Lisa's looking at you know the historical underrepresentation of women in photography and you are trying to highlight what's going on now and I wonder what's changed what's changing I felt I mean you mentioned the um the AIPA doing the women's work exhibition this weekend and they had a stat about how photography students in New Zealand universities, in some cases, up to 70, 80% of them are women, whereas the number of women commercial re photographers represented by photo agents is closer to 20%. And you kind of feel like, Jesus, what's what's changing? <laughs> and mm. is there, is there going to be another archivist, um, you know, in 50 years looking at your archive of on Instagram thinking, oh, well, someone was trying to do something, let's keep this going, you know? Big question, I know, it's no, there's no easy answer. But. Well, I, I, I suppose from, for myself, one thing that I've realized, which has been, and, and I'm, I'm a sort of um, total optimist, you know, you kind, of, you kind of have to be really, is that I'm surrounded now by all of these women who are doing amazing things. So for me, the future is very, very bright, you know, and there's women creating incredible bodies of work. There's, and, and I suppose it's just that thing of you just being, standing up and making yourself heard, making yourself seen, you know, it's the, working on this feed has given me so much more confidence um, in just sort of putting my hand up and saying, you know, and maybe it's because I'm getting older as well. I just don't, I don't allow myself to be mansplained anymore. <laughs> it's just like, so whether, and I think it's that thing of, if we're not happy with how things are, then we've got to make those opportunities for ourselves. And that's, that was one of the things for women in photography. It's like, if I'm not happy that I'm not part of a community, then make one that I'm happy to be a part of. Um, you yeah, know, make these opportunities. Um, Say say yes to things that um, you know could be could be really good. So yeah, the statistics aren't great, but then within galleries, I think it's actually better than it is within the within the commercial world, um, because I know there was a big study into that recently, and I think it is it is better in New Zealand, and we fare better than other parts of the world. But um, there's still like a long way to go for sure. Yeah. You know what do you think, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think there's a long way to go. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of photos I come across um, of art school student groups taken in the 1890s um, in Wellington at Elam. Uh, virtually the whole class is woman, young woman. Mm. Um, a lot of them also worked as retouchers to earn money. Um, yeah, I, don't, I really admire what you've done, Virginia. I think it's great. Um, and I hope that this project answers some questions for people, because even though I'm not a photographer, um, I always felt like this hasn't been much conversation about what women did in photography prior to 1970 here. And that was always a question for me. That's the big thing behind this for me. And I, I mean, I hope other people care about what that history is. And, you know, because one day you'll be part of the history. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to know what was, what was happening because we haven't only, we don't only need um, sort of modern day 
people to look up to. We we all we need to look at you know, what what was happening historically as well, and and look to the works that those women were creating. We talked about the archive at, at Marsden. I mean, that's all female creators. That whole archive is, you know, yeah. female. You know, all of the photo albums they're all created by women, and they're incredible. They're really, really, they're really beautiful. So that's one of the things of looking to the future you know, progressive ideals. It's not ignoring what's happened in the past. It's sort of using it as rocket fuel as well to sort of jettison a somewhere that's definitely going to be, you know, different to where we are now. And it's up to us really how we carve, you know, what that what that actually means. Um, and what it means as a you know, as a woman, as a you know, non non-binary artist, and just making those the more visible and louder those voices are, the more of a difference it's going to make. If we all just sort of sit quietly, and and it's definitely something that I've heard, and I don't know whether it was you saying it, Andy, or I, but I've heard it from a number of people um, who work within the industry saying that that men are a lot more persistent than, than women are, that women kind of go, oh, I've sent one follow-up email and I haven't heard anything, so I don't want to be rude. And it, because it's sort of, and is that because like we've been conditioned to sort of think as a, as a woman, you know, it's sort of, it's maybe you are called pushy and maybe as a man you're called determined. You know, it's sort of, a lot of it comes down to the, comes down to the language which is why I love taking these male dominated spaces and going hey let's have a look at what it looks like from a female perspective or a non-binary perspective you know and just shaking things up a little bit yeah. which I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna round it up for you but without um jumping in and mansplaining over the top of you <laughs> <laughs> Caroline's put a couple of really good links about art world stats in the chat and a good piece um, uh, in a, a couple of references. So I'll make sure that when we put this up on the photo forum website that they're both quoted and we, you can look up that. There's another question that came in, which I think has pretty much been answered by things that we've been talking about over the last few minutes anyway. But I want to I want to say a massive thank you. And Poppy said, uh, sent a really massive thank you saying these are two of the coolest women doing stuff in photography in New Zealand and it's 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 fantastic what you're both doing it really really is and on behalf of everyone that's watching thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us thank you very thank much you Andy. thank you everybody thanks <laughs> I'll turn it off thank you so much speak soon bye bye <laughs>